Hey guys, Chris with Pulometry here. I am so excited because it is finally time to reveal the results of the Power Break project. First, I'm gonna cover the different ways you can measure a break shot, right? How do you collect data on that? What is the best way to compare one break shot to another? For the most part, you just hear people say like, oh wow, this one really smashes them. And it's like, okay, good, I'm glad you like it. But what's the math behind it? So that's what I'm doing in video one. I'm trying to explain my rationale for how I measure break shots. In part two, I explore the best break shot technique. I look at different strategies, like should you hold the back of the cue or should you choke up a little bit? Should you put the ball on the head string or should you break off the rail? In the third video, I'm going to explore the question that is hotly debated. It is what is the best weight for a break cue? And in part four, I am going to anoint the best break cue on the market. Well, at least out of the 10 that I tried. So I will acknowledge that there's probably some other great break cues out there. I think this one's gonna be hard to beat. But in general, what I really wanna get into in that video are the components that make up a good break cue. Now, before we get any further, we have got to answer the question, what is the best way to measure a break shot? Now, I'm not talking about a nine ball break where you might be trying to make the one in the side or get a specific table layout. I'm not talking about straight pool or one pocket where you're really just touching the pack gently. I'm not even talking about when you shoot from the side to hit the second ball with the goal to get the eight ball in. I'm talking about your classic center hit, smash the balls apart, hopefully getting a ball in so you get another turn and having a good table layout for that turn. In order to measure this, I came up with four different rubrics, ways to collect data points from the table when the result of the break is done. Then I could compare one break to the next. What I'm gonna do is break these balls apart and then I'm gonna apply my four rubrics to that result. So for rubric one, there are three data points that I collected. First was how many balls went in the pocket. This is easy, the five ball in the corner, so one. The second thing I did was rate the result of the break on a scale of one to 10. And if I looked at this table, there's no clusters, right? The balls are kind of apart, but it's not really a great break. Um, I did get one in. It's, it's sort of a better than not a bad break, but it's not a great break, probably a seven. The third thing I collected for a data point was whether or not I scratched, and of course I didn't, so I would have put a zero in the column. So now what you see on the screen are the result of my initial rounds using this rubric. And as I used it, I started to realize the very thing I was trying to do was take out the human element of feel. The idea of rating a break from one to 10 just didn't sound right. So I abandoned this rubric and I moved on to rubric two. Rubric two has five data points that I used. First were two positive data points. Of course, how many balls were pocketed? One, but I also counted how many balls were beyond the front half of the table where the head string is, right? So in this case, I would have given one, two, three, and I would have tried to use that number, right? I have three balls that came up table. That's a sign of a good break when the balls are moving this way. But then I had three negative points. I counted if I scratched. I counted if how many balls were left inside the original triangle area, right? So I would look this and if it was touching, I counted it. So I would give myself a negative one, two, three for this break because the balls need to leave that location. I also gave myself some negative points when I had a cluster. So I would look and I would just visually see are any balls within one inch of each other? And in this table, there are no clusters by that definition. Again, you see the results of my rubric two tests and I started to realize that there was just an element of user error coming into these tests that I was trying to get out. That's the whole point of this exercise, was to let it be objective. There were two things I wanted to get rid of. One was the scratches, right? If you scratch, that's your fault. That's not the equipment's fault. The second thing I wanted to get rid of was the clusters. Although it seems sort of a really interesting thing, I started to realize every now and then there'd be one, is, is that an inch apart or is that an inch and a quarter? So it just sort of felt like I was sort of saying, well, yeah, that's a cluster. And I didn't want that human element involved. So onto rubric three. And I hold up my phone because I started 
recording the sound between the two points of impact in the break, in which you can use that in order to tell the speed of the ball in miles per hour, which I think is pretty cool and a really valuable piece of information because that's what we're doing here, right? Get that ball moving fast. I also kept three other points of data. I kept how many balls went in the pocket. I kept your triangle break, right? How many balls were in the triangle zone? And I kept how many balls went up table. So again, here you see some of my results from my rubric three samples. So I started to notice some more things that were bugging me about the rubric that were, instead of being human error, they were just unlucky. For example, sometimes I would have a really strong break. You can just feel it, right? And the ball's just like spread all over the table and just nothing goes in. And you go, and that was one of my best breaks and nothing went in. And sometimes you feel like you hit the ball not as well and you got two balls in and you're gonna, I know that wasn't as good a break. And I also was noticing for the triangle, how many balls in the triangle, there was a bit of luck there too. Sometimes the balls would bounce off the rail and back into the triangle zone. I worked hard to break those out of that zone. The same thing was happening for balls up table. Sometimes I'd hit the ball so hard, they would go all the way up table, and then at the very end, I'm watching them roll right back on this end. And by definition of my data points, I wasn't gonna get credit for those balls moved up table either. So I get rid of those three things, and that left me with one miles per hour. This is my conclusion that to measure a break shot, all the other factors are relying on human error or they're relying on some sort of luck. The thing I wanna know about a break shot is what is the best way to get the cue ball moving at the fastest speed towards the pack? Whether or not you hit the front of the pack, that's on you. Whether or not you get some balls in, that's a little bit of luck. So that's what I measure in the rest of this series. I measure miles per hour as my sole indicator for determining the best power break shot.